through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 251. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today we're going to discuss Gwyneth Paltrow in honor of Iron Man 3. Trazium Iron Man, if you will. Oh, yeah, look at you. In 3D. Oh. Is yeah. it in 3D? It is. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering. I don't, I don't check Why would I thing. just mess with you, man? Because it's fun. Mm, and that easy. Is true. And basically victimless, because no one, even me, is going to give a crap. Yeah. You know, uh, it's funny to think, I mean, realistically, she's been in Hollywood, I guess, about three decades or so. Yeah, something like that. But... You don't really think about the extent of her body of work. I mean, I think if you look on IMDb or something, there's like 33 films or something okay. listed. It's not, it's not crazy long. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you know, she's done a lot of impressive stuff. Yeah. And it, it's, it's kind of one of those things that you kind of forget about at times. And Definitely. Because of that, you know, this is another one of those pe per people mm -hmm. that there's a ton of different films we could talk about. Yes, but many that we've talked about before. Yeah, and then there's some, you know, like Sylvia. I, I mean, that's just not my bag. So if you want to write your advocate for her great performance in Sylvia, I'd love to hear it, but that's just not my kind of And film, I unfortunately so. haven't seen it, so. So you're just, you're just a jackass, and I'm really, I'm just lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so really, the yeah, response yeah. should be for everybody. So we, we will, again, you know, we want other people to share their thoughts and their feelings and fill in some of those gaps because, Please you know, do. we can't see everything she's done. No. Nope. I mean, we can't, especially but. because some of the stuff she's done, I'm not a huge fan of, so it makes it harder for me to... Uh, do, watch. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> now you to find out. Music. Yeah, exactly. We'll see. We'll see what Greg thinks as we go through this list. Nevertheless, you know, we're going to start uh, in the mid-90s, 1996 to be exact, and we're going to talk about Hard 8. This is Paul Thomas Anderson's yes. directorial debut, or feature debut, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a thriller, if you will. Yeah, I would say that. Uh, starring Philip Baker Hall and John C. Riley, uh, as sort of uh, Philip Baker Hall plays a gambler, sort of takes John C. Riley under his wing, yeah, finds him like sad and broke in the beginning. Exactly, but, yeah. you know, cuts to a few years later, John C. Riley sort of gains life on track. Mm -hmm. uh, he married Gwyneth Paltrow, yes. and uh, you know things sort of go, go sideways. Samuel L. Jackson pops in for a bit, just for fun. yeah. I mean, it's crazy to think about. You know, this is before. PTA was really a thing. Yeah, so John C. Riley was still like a nobody at this time. Well, just about. Um, I mean, I, th I mean, shit. Samuel Jackson was not nearly where he was now. I think this is probably you know right around the same time as like Long Kiss Goodnight. Mm -hmm. And if you think about his role in that, I mean, yeah, yeah he was can... one of the leads, but he was not like revered like yeah. he is today. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, she was very much unknown. I mean, this is right. I think a year or two, or right around the same time as Seven. So That's it's right. very much, you know, traditionally a supporting actress. Uh -huh. um, yeah, John C. R. Iowa was not a thing. I mean, he, him and Paul Thomas Anderson obviously grew their yes. careers together yes. and very much. Um, it's interesting to realize that this movie had such a problem getting completed or even getting released. Um, in fact, uh, Funds ran out for the movie, and Paul Thomas Anderson contacted New Line and got money that was advanced for him for Boogie Nights to finish this film. Hmm. Yeah, and donations from the cast to raise the necessary $250,000 required to finish the film. And the film company Reicher, Reicher, Reicher signed off on his director's cut on the proviso that he changed the title to Heart Eight because it was originally titled Sydney after the main character, Sydney. Mm, which um, is Philip Baker Hall. Yes. And although Anderson agreed the change, it didn't stop Reicher from barely releasing the film. I think it took two years after it was done to be actually distributed. Well, I think it's one of those films that sort of gained an audience in retrospect as people sort of fallen in love with Definitely. Um, PTA's work. It's interesting that the cast was involved with donations. It makes you wonder who. I mean, obviously, probably in this cast, probably Philip Baker Hall and maybe Samuel L. Jackson. Probably. Phil probably. I mean, but Samuel L. Jackson was not nearly as wealthy probably as Probably Philip Baker Hall, most of it, I would Well, say. the other one, I mean, I'm wondering, we didn't really mention it when we got started, but, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow comes from a Hollywood family. I yes. mean, if you think about, like, the Barrymores and stuff when you think, you know, classic Hollywood mm -hmm, families, mm -hmm. but her family has been involved very much so in yes. Hollywood, and so you wonder if maybe some of that cashish made its way down. Maybe. Maybe, maybe it did. So, I don't know. I also think it's just a random interesting thing that Paul Thomas Anderson wanted the film to open with just the production company info, the quotes, a Paul Thomas, a P.T. Anderson picture, and the title with no other credits. But weirdly enough, in order for this to happen, all members of the cast and crew have to sign 
away their main credit rights. Mm. And one producer, Robert Jones, didn't consent, so the film ended up with full opening credits. Like it's literally that much that one dude said, nah. And so they had to do it. Even I wonder, I, I mean, I wonder, it's, it's one of those sort of things like, you know, I get it. You know, getting a film out there is hard. Yeah. And so you probably, you know, if it's your one shop, you want to do it. But do you think, like, by the time Boogie Nights has come around, PTA is like, fuck you, you're not no, going to be in my film? Exactly, exactly. That's one of those things is you think about these, like, crazy, like, Nolan and all these um, powerhouses when they're making their first movie are probably working their butts off and making a lot of... A lot of changes that they didn't want to have to make, and this was definitely one of those because they didn't want to change the name. The studio thought that people would confuse it, think it was about Australia. I mean, this is, it's, it's funny to think, you know, Seven being the year before this, yes. Heart Eight being in 1996. It's it's kind of funny to think about Gwyneth Paltrow sort of being very much in throw as a like, granted as a child and like Hook. That's yes. a very different thing. <laughs> yes. But, you know, her early days were very much sort of these violent, noir ish type roles. Yeah. This is much more active, her engagement in this one versus Seven, where she was yes. more of an accessory character. <laughs> Definitely. But at the same time, the very same year, she had Emma. Yes. Which is, you know... What? Based on Jane Austen, a yeah. very famous Victorian writer, yes. Pride and Prejudice, Emma, etc. It, and it's a very much a uh, sort of 90s storyline, if you will, about a woman who... Is a matchmaker, matchmaker yeah. for everyone but herself, and yeah. ultimately she's the one who's toughest to fall in love, mm -hmm. basically. And she causes a lot of problems too. In this, in the 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 interesting thing about the original source material and this film with Quinn Paltrow is that it's about this lady who thinks she's so good at lining people up, and it's not only that she's not as not actually that great at lining people up right. with herself, but it's also that she's not that good with lining people up with each other, because she tries to shove people together that don't want to be together and makes problems and things go awry, and it basically all blows up in her face. And, pe I mean, people are sort of skeptical towards mm -hmm. her about it. Like, I yeah, think her she, family... She takes mm -hmm. cre uh, credit for two people who get married and leave in the very beginning. She's like, oh, that's because of me. And yeah. they're like, no, it's not because of you. And she's like, all right, let's do a challenge. I'll get these people to go together and then things go wrong. And the film takes place sort of over the course of the year. And a big, mm -hmm. a big part of it is her relationship with Tony Collette, who she yes. really sets about trying to set up, you know, first she wants to set her, set her up with, I think it was Alan Cumming. I think you're right, yeah. And then, you know, I forget who else is in there. I mean, she he had a... Um, there's a lot of people in the movie. There's like a lot all of people. Jane Austen, there's lots of characters. Yeah, but she, I mean, they're sort of like, it's 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 very much sort of the same as like Clueless, where... Mm, yeah, um, oh yeah, I can see the comparison. You know, um, there's like the character that they're trying to set up, and then uh, there's the one who's their friend the whole time. That's really who they should end well, up. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, well, they they have the like the you know, in Clueless, Breck and Meyer yes. was the 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 in love with um, what's her name, uh, Brittany Murphy, yes. and she tries to set him up, set her up with the more attractive mm -hmm. popular guy. Same sort of thing here is where she has somebody who's probably maybe more appropriate for her, yes. but yes. she tries to steer her away from yeah. that and. Uh, and it's relatively true to the source material, with the exception that in the source material, with the, in, as well as Emma being kind of ousted for her bad matchmaking skills, there's also some class arrogance mm. and class struggle in the original book that basically she's a total upper class lady who thinks she can get away with everything and people kind of are like, hey, you can't just... Because you're super rich, you can't just make people's lives be whatever you want them to be. And I mean, it's sort of dumb to say, and it's sort of unfair to Gwyneth Paltrow, but this is sort of the first time I appreciated her as, not as being a talented actress, mm. but as sort of her own person. Yeah, being I mean, lead, essentially. Well, not, not just that, like, you know, I didn't see Heart 8 until I had, like, I don't know, like in the 2000s or something like that. Um, I had seen Seven before this, yes. but at that point it was like, you know, she was more known for a relationship with Brad yeah, Pitt. Yeah, she's Brad Pitt's wife. She's yeah. in the movie. Well, she's no, in, oh, they dated her. Yes, that's they were right, dating. Yeah. And so it was sort of like, I didn't realize, you know, uh, you know, did she get this role because... You know, she was dating Brad Pitt mm -hmm. or something like that, yeah. which is totally unfair because she's very talented. Exactly. But at the same time, you know, this was the point I was like, oh, no, no, she can stand on her own two feet. She's very talented because, I mean, her role in Seven is very small. Yeah. Very it's, small. Yeah. She, I mean, she, I mean, a lot of stuff I've seen of hers before this tended to be sort of smaller roles. And this is sort of like so. very much throwing her out mm -hmm. in front. I mean, she's on the poster. She's the titular character, she, yeah, Emma Wodehouse. I, mean, I think she was picked directly by the director. In fact, he wanted her, after her uh, performance in uh, Seven, 
after seeing the performance in Seven. It's very interesting. Uh, directed by was it Doug McGrath? Yeah. So you know, I, I mean, I think it was Seven. Correct me if I'm wrong, Internet. <laughs> you know, I I won't go so far as to say that I'm a fan of Emma. Mm. You know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a big period piece. Exactly. Person. You know, it's it's not my wheelhouse either. But I very much you know I remember I think saying like you know reports on like Entertainment Tonight and stuff talking about the film being made and being like. Oh wow, this this is sort of a big a big deal, you know. So I, I mean, it's kind of weird, yeah. Like all the costumes are recycled costumes from other period pieces really? at the time. Like not all of them, but most of them. Like if you look at the trivia on IMDb, it's like all about how this the thing that this person wore at this point is a person that this other person wore in this other movie, or this thing this person wore was a thing. Like even her white fur cloak thing that she's wearing in the cover of the film is from some other film that was used in some uh, Victorian I mean, period I, piece. I feel like you know if you really go down that road, you can probably find all sorts of stuff yeah. in movies. I mean, you, if you ever been to like a studio, there's so many things that are recycled. And it probably makes sense. There's probably one really really good Victorian clothing designer, and they just always go back. To to that person. They're like, hey, Freddie, we need another, we're making another movie in Victoria's England. He's like, boom, let's roll out the red carpet. I got everything for you. Well, it's interesting, you know, Doug McGrath hasn't done a heck of a lot of stuff, but, you know, he did do at least um, one other project that did involve Gwyneth Paltrow, and it was um, Infamous, oh, okay. the other Truman Capote movie yes. starring Toby Jones. So, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of reunited for that, so that's kind of nice. But, yeah, I, I mean, not not my cup of tea, but definitely sort of what brought her to my attention. Yes, yes. Uh, carrying on that sort of vibe, you know, we're just going to jump a couple years later and discuss A Perfect Murder. Yeah. This is the remake of Hitchcock's Dial M for Murder. Loosely. It's, it's, it's a loose. liberal it's remake very... of Dial M for Murder based on a play by Frederick Knott. So Frederick Knott made a play that this is a liberal interpretation of that play is based, I think, originally on Dial M for Murder. Yeah, or the I mean, it, it's 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 definitely got similar inspiration, you know? It's, oh, totally. about, it's about a husband. And a perfect murder is a quote that's used in Dial M for Murder, yeah. so. I mean, both of them are sort of about a, a, a husband who becomes aware of, or who's in trouble, yes. becomes aware of his philandering wife. Who has a fortune. Who has a fortune, heir, yes. As an heiress. Um, sort of tries to blackmail someone into murdering Yes. for him and uh, in this case you know it's kind of funny to think yeah, about I know it's Vigo Vigo yeah. Mortensen is, is the uh, is the, the love uh, interest yes the, uh, and Michael Douglas playing the husband yes <clears throat> and you know I mean it's funny to think about because I love movies but I believe I saw this before uh, Dial on for Murder which oh. is kind of surreal in some ways I probably say that strangely enough probably the same I, mean, I wouldn't say it. I was like, what, 16 when this came out? No, so yeah, it wasn't until the early 2000s that I went into my whole Hitchcock retrograde exactly, of like yeah. watching them all. But. You know, it's, I mean, I like, there are whole shades of Michael Douglas I like. I, yes. mean, I like a funny one. You know, Wonder Boys was just a couple years later, I mm -hmm. think. So that's great. But the you know, The Game was a, a couple years uh, later as well. It might have even been before that, I forget. Oh, um, yeah, I think it's 96, maybe. Oops. See what we I'll got. figure it out. Oh. But um, the, my my point being is um, ninety seven, the year before. Nice. Uh, is that nice. I love a menacing Michael Douglas. Like you he think really about like Wall Street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like he he's <laughs> so he can do vile so well he can and do intense. The thing that's amazing about him is that. Even when he's vile, you don't hate him. Like Gordon yeah. Gecko, you should hate Gordon <laughs> yeah. Gecko. But he's also likable. He's vi he's he's intense and he's vile. But there's a certain element of him that's I guess it's a charm more charming. Mm -hmm. I would say there's a he's that guy who's the the sleazy car salesman who's ch who's totally screwing you over. But he's also very charming about it. And you can't help but be yeah. slightly entertained. And the thing that's interesting about Perfect Murder and Dial for Murder is that you know you think about it on the surface. Michael Douglas is, I mean, vile because he mm -hmm. wants to kill his wife yeah. and get her fortune. But at the same time, like, is there really anybody in the story that's, like, the good guy? I mean, the wife <laughs> yeah. is cheating. Yeah. Yeah. Vigo is cheating with her. And he's, Vigo's he's got, got a, criminal. a bad, yeah, he's got a bad past of being a con man. Right, like, he, he agrees to murder her or yeah. get someone, he gets someone to try and murder Which is where her. things go wrong. I mean, uh, I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, yeah, I mean, she's not killing anyone per se, but you know, she ultimately well, ends up killing I Michael Douglas. I was gonna say she does. I mean, <laughs> granted he sort of probably go you could say has it coming or whatever or it's appropriate. Two different endings, by the way. Yeah, but they're essentially the same. It's no, just basically it's literally the, the only difference being is 
is Michael Douglas killed because he's vile, or is he killed because she's r- wicked? That's really the only difference between the two endings. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's like one he like I guess lunges for or whatever. Yeah, one he one lunges he, for her, she kills her, she's like, oh, I'm the victim. The other one, she shoots him without him really doing much, and he says, you'll pay for this. Well, and then I, dies. I think he says something like, you can't, you'll never get away from That's me, right, or something yeah. like that, and then she shoots him, um, which is on the DVD. Yes, uh, as a deleted scene again, an you know, example of something that's kind of interesting. Yep, yeah, Renan's scarecrow video. But, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I I don't, I guess, I mean, it, because everyone else is so evil, it kind of makes Gwyneth Paltrow kind of come off as being like a heroine, even though she's not necessarily without flaws herself. And, you Correct. know, I generally am of the mindset that I don't like movies that have no likable characters, but that's not fair to this movie. That's true. Because, I mean, besides knowing that she's having an affair... She's a very charming woman. And everyone in this movie, I think, at some point in the, in the film, which is what's interesting about it, comes across as the one who is the hero and the victim. At some point, Michael mm. Douglas is the hero victim because he's in trouble and his wife is cheating on him. And right, then it's, yeah. she's, you know, the no, victim because her husband's plotting murder on her. And then Vigo's the victim because he's getting blackmailed. But he's also, like, everyone is not 100% like... <laughs> well, I think that's the thing that's beautiful about it is it lives in the gray. Yes. Whereas, you know, that's oftentimes sort of a muff. How surprising often... that a uh, something based on a Hitchcock film would be involve shades of gray. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But it's funny because, you know, the same, very same year, you know, she was in Shakespeare in Love. This is obviously the uh, much ballyhooed Academy Award winning story about uh, Shakespeare and his writing of Romeo and Juliet. Yes, young Shakespeare. Young Shakespeare. Counting its win for Best Picture, it has the most Oscars ever won without winning Best uh, Director, which is seven. It won seven Oscars, but no Best Director. I think I would argue Argo over this one for Best Director. And that, huh. It was ever deserved. I, not only that, but I would say you could probably take the seven awards from this film, give Argo double awards of any that they both have, and Argo would still be undeserved, and Shakespeare in Love would still be I mean, overloved. we've talked about our displeasure with this before. I mean, this is the same year as, I believe, Saving Private Ryan. And I think it's just, so. It's just sort of like... Elizabeth came out this year because Judy Dench yeah. got a nom. And it's just Kate, like... Kate it's it's so perplexing how this film... I mean, the studio... I think it was probably Weinstein. Yeah, I think um, it is. I'm pretty sure. I'm almost 100% sure. But, it, you know... <laughs> no, it's Universal. Oh, wow. oh Miramax. Sorry. Yeah, so, Miramax. so he's in there it's, getting his it's, grubby it's, little fat yeah, fingers. Yeah, I mean, this, if this doesn't prove how good... Harvey Weinstein is at running awards campaigns. Like yeah, and that. just making money. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just like, it's flabbergasting. I mean, you got Joseph Fiennes, who plays Shakespeare. Yes. And granted, he's he's a very charming guy. Yeah, like, I yeah like he's Joseph not Fiennes. bad. He's great in uh, Enemy of the Gates. Yeah, he's got, he's got some good stuff on his uh, mm-hmm. filmography. Uh, I don't I don't dislike Gwyneth Paltrow. And, I mean, I, she's sort of an interesting yeah. character. She's She wants to be an actress, but this is before women were allowed yep. to act. So and that's a big, boy. Yeah. a big issue in the film where mm-hmm. like, people are, uh, you know, rested or yes. pro- production shut down mm-hmm. because of it. And uh, the one thing I really will give it credit for is that it doesn't go for the true Hollywood ending. I mean, there's the end where they do the play mm-hmm. and, you know, they sort of have their moment. But at the end, she goes her way. Like, mm-hmm. she goes off with her husband, and he sort of has this fantasy of what happens, you know, gets in a shipwreck, and she yeah. goes on, and whatever. Which is probably Tempest. Uh, Twelfth Night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Yes. No, it, it starts that's... out with it starts out with uh, Shakespeare trying to write Twelfth that's Night. Right. He gets blocked. He meets her while she, he's auditioning people for the production, and through that love is what inspires yeah. Romeo and Juliet. That's right, yeah. He's getting... It, 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 the... You know, it's so frustrating to me that you can have a film called Shakespeare in Love. And William Shakespeare receives no credit for this film. Even though they use portions of Romeo and Juliet, lines from his plays, his name, a character based on who who he was believed to be, because, you know, there's all the theory that he didn't actually exist. I mean, and he doesn't receive a single, like, thanks to Will Sha- Bill Billy Shakespeare. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. Really? Really? Also, this has, as I love to point out, because at the time, this is what, 98? I'm, I'm like classic high school hormones, ball of puberty, most unnecessary nudity in any film I've ever seen. I've seen more necessary man penis in film than I have as when I saw Gwyneth Paltrow topless in this movie. And it makes no sense either in a Victorian time that characters would be so flu- like flaunt and about their or flaunt their bodies so much. It wasn't uh, it's, yeah, it's, problems. I hate it. It's it's definitely problematic. I mean, you got you got to uh, also note that this is with Paltrow's one and only Academy Award nomination, <laughs> and she won. Oh, 
Yeah, she won Best Damn Supporting it. Actress. Damn it. it. It's 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 kind of surreal in some ways that I mean it did I mean you think about the films in recent history that have sort of had similar successes that are sort of you you mentioned um like a beautiful mind mm-hmm. was listed on the top yeah, twenty. Overrated, worst, yeah, overrated, yeah. Which I mean, I would put this above a beautiful mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, but like, you think like Crash is another uh-huh. one that gets a lot of English flag. Patient. English patient, yeah, totally. But you I mean you think, yeah, what did she she beat? Let's see, Cape uh, Blanchett for Elizabeth, Fernanda Montenegro for Central Station, Meryl Streep for One True Thing. That's a shock. She beat Meryl Streep, and she beat Emily Watson for Hillary and Jackie. You know. I wouldn't say there's any like clear head and tail better performance, but you know I think you know obviously you got Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett's pretty solid. I also think it's interesting that it was what like uh, this was a weird 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 year for the Academy Awards because Kate Blanchett got a two different actors were awarded two different nomination or nominated for two different awards where they played the same character. Yeah, Judy Dench for supporting actress. Gwyneth Paltrow was the lead in this movie, obviously. Yeah, so and then uh, so. Kate Blanchett, Blanchett got, for, yeah, yeah, Elizabeth. You know, I, 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 just a weird random. I guess Queen Elizabeth was in in '98. Yeah, this was just this was just a run, this is part of the run of the sort of kill the Academy Awards for me, where you had uh, English Patient, mm-hmm. Titanic, and this all in consecutive years. I was like, is there clearly a formula to win an Academy yeah. Award? Do any other movies ever count if one of these come out? Yeah. No, yeah. they don't. In terms of more interesting projects yes. for her, just a year later, and kind of a, a, a popping project in of its own mm-hmm. way, was The Talented Mr. Ripley. Yes. This is the Matt Damon story about a guy and who... And Jude Law. Jude Law. He's in there, too. Uh, about a man who sort of... Um, I don't want you to describe. He's kind of a loner, doesn't have a yeah. lot of friends. He gets connected with Jude Law. Yeah, he gets goes, mistaken for someone who knew Who's a good friend of him. Yeah. Like he I think he tangentially knew him. His family yeah. asks him to go bring Jude Law back. Back from Rome where he's basically squandering money. Yeah. And so he goes there, he sort of becomes friends and you know, it's you know, your classic sort of single white female type story where eventually, you know, once he um once Gwyneth Paltrow, who's Jude Law's friend, sort yes. of says, like, you know, you're, this guy's kind of creepy. Uh, Jude Law finally discovers how creepy he is. Yes. And instead of trying to, you know, just go his own separate way, he decides, you know, well, I'm just going to kill him and take over his life, which he does. Yeah, I think he just kills him and hides the body. And then on his way back, someone ident- mistakes him for Jude Law. And so he decides yes. that he will pose as him. Yes. And starts putting an elaborate, like, two hotel rooms. Yeah, yeah. And- yeah, and it continues down that line. Whenever people notice who he might be, he kills them. Yeah, uh, and it almost—I mean, it always gets to the point where he kills uh, Grant Paltrow, which mm-hmm. is during sort of the latter third of the movie, yes. where he he realizes like this. And John he, Davenport. He can't he can't keep up his um, story as was it Dicky? Yes. Jude Law's character. He can't keep it going, and eventually he's like, "You commit suicide." No, mm-hmm. he's dead. Yeah, and. Um, it gets to the point where Gwyneth Paltrow like sees like Dickie's ring in his yeah. possession and is like, uh oh, he's gonna have to kill him. But she's like, Oh, if he gave you his ring, he must have committed suicide, <laughs> which is a lucky break for him. Yeah, seriously. But I mean in essence, you know, it ends with sort of like, you know, him feeling like he's never gonna escape this uh um, cycle. Cy- well, not just the cycle, but that uh, he's it's gonna catch up with him. Mm, yes, because I think it's like him and Kate Blanchett is gonna like who's in it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she's, like, giving him money that supposedly Dickie left for Ripley's character. Yes, he inherits the yeah. money that Dickie's death... Yes, um, and then at, he realizes at that point that John Davenport's character aunt knew him as someone else, and Kate Blanchett's character knew him as someone else, and right. eventually the two... And at this point, he's fallen for John Davenport, and he... The, it, he kills John Davenport as well. Interestingly enough, something I had no idea about this movie, which is fascinating considering how good it is, I should really check these out. It's based on a novel of the same name by Patricia Highsmith. There are additional four novels that follow this movie about Ripley. Ripley Underground, Ripley's Game, The Boy Who Followed Ripley, and Ripley Underwater. Uh, there's also another movie. Yeah, there's Call actually two different movies. One yeah. one that has John Malkovich playing Yeah, it's Ripley. the adult mm-hmm. version of him. Yeah. Uh, how about I blow your mind? Oh, I'm ready. Okay, do it. Do it. Blow, blow um, me, Spencer. The director, <laughs> <laughs> the director of this movie, Anthony Minkella. Okay. Do you know why this is noteworthy? Mm-mm. Do you know he directed three years prior to this? I do not. The English Patient. Ah, you 
son of a bitch. Even more, you got me. Even you more got entertaining. Me. <laughs> um, do you know I directed three years before that? Three Ninjas? No. no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wrong. Oh. <laughs> A little romantic comedy with Matt, or, uh, Matt Dillon. Yeah, Rom Dom. Uh, Rom Drom, whatever you want to call it. And then just a few years after this, he re teamed with um, Drew Law again and did Cold Mountain. Mm. So. I also think it's interesting this is the sec one of two role movies where Jude Law plays a character who is killed and assumed by someone else, the other being Gattaca. Yeah, but wasn't that one more. Um, uh, Willingly, well, but yeah, still, like, you know, two yeah. roles were, were. And what's funny to me is neither Ethan Hawke nor Matt Damon look like Jude Law to me. So I don't, I yeah, don't, I don't see I didn't, I didn't, I that really, yeah. part. That's the part that I have the most problem with. That felt like a bit of a stretch. Yeah. I also think it's interesting because you know most of this, this movie takes place entirely in Rome for the most part, with these small excerpts in New York City. But the scenes shot in New York City, set in New York City, that opened the movie were originally shot in Rome. Hmm. But they deemed it too unsatisfactory and later just went to New York City to shoot them. So they were like, well, we're in Rome, let's shoot everything. Ah, crap, we gotta actually go to New York. Yeah. We're uh, going back there anyway. Oh, it's, I guess it's a, a good uh, example that you should listen to your friends, though, you know, because clearly <laughs> Mr. Ripley, a sketchy dude, Gwyneth yep. Paltrow was onto somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna move forward, though, yes. to a very, very different path from basically everything we've talked about <laughs> yeah. thus far, and that was 2001's Shallow Hal. We're talking the Fairway Brothers yes. here, team up with Jack Black, about a guy who um, is totally, I don't know what you call him, a chauvinist, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's bigot, just, he doesn't like fat mis, people. He's, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I would, he's very chauvinistic, just yeah. very male, bad sides of the male ego, wants only attractive ladies, yes. and even though it's Jack Black, so it's... Right. And his it's other absurd. friend who's that way is Jason Alexander. It makes Again. perfect sense that the two most unattractive guys in the movie are completely I unwilling. Well, I think that's part of the I know it humor is. of it, I is know. that it's, it's the absurdity of, like, why can this yes. guy do it? And, you know, he runs into Tony Robbins, playing <laughs> Tony Robbins, <laughs> in an elevator who hypnotizes him to start seeing the inner beauty of people. Yes. And that involves seeing the inner beauty of Gwyneth Paltrow's character. Yes. Play it was uh, Rosemary, mm -hmm. who is a overweight woman, but yep. he sees her as Gwyneth Paltrow. Yes, and you know rom com ensues. And no surprise, Gwyneth Paltrow put on a huge crazy fat suit to play yes. the fat version of herself, and went on Oprah and cried about how hard it was to walk around town as a fat person for a day. And then everybody that was fat said, "Fuck you, Gwyneth." When yeah, she was able seriously. to take it off the next day and still be Gwyneth Paltrow. And it's like, like you know what? Oh yeah, by the way, people's most beautiful woman in the world. Yeah. <laughs> People, you're dumb. Well, it's, it's, sorry, Gwyneth Paltrow, you're not ugly, but you're not the most beautiful. But it's also world. just sort of like, you know, it feels Come like on. every beautiful person feels that need. Like, the entire bank's put on a fat suit. Like, it's just like every, like, model's like, oh, I want to feel how the other thing uh, lives. And it's like, it's terrible. I'm uh, going back to my normal stuff. No, it's, duh. That's why you're not fat in the first place. You're Because you're, yeah. success, you're successful because you have your like, crazy, thin, Hollywood, blonde icon who probably has a physical trainer that makes more money than I do in Right, the year. right. You and know, this is... Definitely makes more money than I do. This is sort of on the... I mean, I thought the film was okay. It's, it's, it's decent, not a like, horrible but, movie. But this is definitely on the downslope of the Fairway Oh, yeah, that's me. for sure. Like, I love Dumb and Dumber. I love Same. Kingpin. Something About Mary yep. was great. I even loved Me, Myself, and Irene. As did I. Uh, Osmosis Jones was definitely sort of a step down. This followed that. Then Stuck on You. Mm, like with Matt yeah. Damon. And uh, Fever Pitch was decent. Heartbreak Kid, decent. But basically, they haven't really hit it again. And then they hit scraped the bottom. Sorry, anybody who disagrees with their Three Stooges. Mm -hmm. Scraped the bottom. And now Aaron and Nick, you're wrong. It's a horrible yeah, movie. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Uh, now they're throwing <laughs> a Hail Mary and trying to go back to Dumb and Dumber with Dumb and Dumber 2. Because um, the prequel that they made was already horrible. Well, they didn't. They, they were just producers, oh, okay. I believe, on that. They didn't actually direct that. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, this is sort of one of the lesser thans. But yes. it's still, I mean, it's still relatively funny. I mean, it's, it's not a bad movie, but it's, you know, it's pretty standard for its idea. I will say the one thing about it is, in terms of, like, the Fairway Brothers careers, this is probably one of the most pointed movies mm. like most of their films are just about like people being <laughs> jick, dicks and yeah. saying shitty language yeah, and, like, and being, being crude yeah where this one actually you know there's there is a sort of message wrapped in there this and it's i guess true. me myself and irene might be another one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like or, it, it's i mean it's really sort of like this is one of the few times where they're like you know look you know message it's really like it's you, People should look at the inner beauty of people because that's really the most important thing. Granted, it's in sort of this crazy package. But, yes. You know, I, I, I don't. It's I, all right. I can't say like I hate it or anything no. like that. It's not. It's just not great. It's not. 
<laughs> in terms of good stuff that came out the same year, mm-hmm. the Royal Tenenbaums. Yes. We're talking um, Wes Anderson here. Indeed. This is what this was the follow up to um, Rushmore. Rushmore, I believe. Yes. Yes. Um, and again, carrying over very much a lot of the same cast yep. there. You know, um, it's. I- I think uh, Gene Hackman and Angelica Houston both uh, were, uh, you know, obviously approached and didn't want to mm. do it until more scenes establishing their characters were written in. Mm. In fact, Gene Hackman at, was worried about the fact that he had an actual in real life reputation as being kind of a dick dad. Interesting. And so he actually went to his family and asked his family if they thought he should do it because he didn't want to represent something that might be too mm. real. And they all were like, no, you should totally go for it. Which, great idea, because damn he kills in this movie yeah i mean it's about a, a dysfunctional family of like i don't know what you call them talented kids who yeah. are sort of a lot of auteurs basically yeah. kind of prodigies prodigies yeah. that's a perfect word prodigies are sort of like used by their parents <laughs> um, to the utmost utmost and sort of like you know years later they are all sort of brought back together yeah they all he, had a heyday that existed then and now they're all kind of back together and all dysfunctional upon his sort of like announced proc proclamation whatever you want to call it that he's going to die that's right so he finally wants to get to know all of them and you know the this functional families ben stiller luke wilson and gwyneth paltrow with an extended family of owen wilson kind of being a friend of the family that kind of is under their wing yes but i I mean he's not actually related technically i don't think gwyneth paltrow is related either oh yeah yeah she's a half sister no, I, th- I think they like adopt her. Is it because oh, yeah. she has the love story with Luke that's Wilson? That's right. Yeah, that's right. And that would be a really yeah. different spin if they're actually. Owen related. Wilson is in no way actually even that much family. He was like the neighbor kid or across yes, the street. Yes, he was, that was exactly. Friends he was friends with, with uh, Luke Wilson, I yes. believe. Yes. Yes. And uh, I mean, you know, this was this is. I'll, I'll be completely honest. This is one of those films that like I saw, and I thought it was okay. Like mm. I was not blown away. And I generally I'll stick to my guns about you know Wes Anderson. I think he's a very talented guy. His uh, eye for. Uh, set design, yes. design oh, is man. very impressive, and he's he's a good writer as well. But you know, this is not one of those films that immediately blew me away. And it wasn't until I later saw it uh, recently, actually, on the Blu-ray mm. uh, Criterion. Criterion edition, and I was like, wow, this is a lot more nuanced than I thought. And I enjoy it. I still think it's a lot like his other stuff. Still think Fantastic Mr. Fox is his best thing. <laughs> but it really, it did it it impressed me much more than I had remembered, and it really gave a sort of second life to it in my experience. Which is good. I mean, you should deserve it. Because I think it's probably one of his best, in my opinion. Yeah, I think most people would consider it one of his best. And gotta also give a shout-out to his music. Oh, yeah. He's always got fantastic music in his movies. I think it's interesting that, um, like, just to tell you, like, at this point, even after only Rushmore, how much people... Two of these people are not surprising, but how much people wanted to be in Wes Anderson projects. Uh, Danny Glover, Owen, and Luke Wilson all turned down parts in Ocean's Eleven to be in wow. this movie. Which I w- I'm not surprised. Cool. I bet you Owen and Luke Wilson were probably the Casey Affleck. Oh, totally. Uh, and they would have been brother. better than them. <laughs> but still, I mean, and, and you know, and Danny Glover probably Don Cheadle's character or one of the older gentlemen. Hard to say. But either way, it's interesting that they would turn down something like Ocean's Eleven, which if you think about where it went is mm-hmm. like... But still, qu- pro- still also a very good choice considering this film. And also, you know, although the, most of the exteriors were shot in New York, Wes Anderton, in, Anderson intentionally avoided as many shots as he could of skyscrapers or any other distinct New York landmarks to the point where um, Royal and Pagoda are talking in Battery Park on the south southern tip of Manhattan, and Wes Anderson initially had Pagoda stand directly in front of the Statue of Liberty so it wouldn't show up in the shot. Like, they staged That's him to awesome. block it out so you couldn't even, like, tell if you didn't obviously know already. But And I gotta give a lot of credit to Gwyneth Paltrow for her role as sort of, like... Margot? I don't know if you want to call her, what, dispassionate? Um, like, she's... She's very distant, monotone, yeah. um, and you know I think that reserved, takes, reserved. Okay, that's good. Uh, I think that takes a lot more uh, talent than people probably give her credit for. It yeah, because it. it's hard to be that like one wooden and one dimensional yeah. and not have it come across as really bad. And she yeah. really like makes herself seem like character that has a lot of walls. And it's one of those things that as the film goes along, she sort of does sort of let those yes. walls down, and you sort of begin to sort of get a feel from her. And I think that. Her um, arc perhaps is the deepest of the three kids. Probably. Probably deeper than uh, Ben Stiller and yeah. Luke Wilson. I mean, 
Uh, but they're all they're all good. It's Owen all Wilson's good. got a nice little dip in there. I, I like him as well. Yeah, no, they're they're all they're all pretty. Such good. a great cast movie. So well, it's just amazing. Yep. Brings us to uh, this Friday, mm-hmm. May third. We're talking Iron Man three. This is the Trezium Iron Man, as we've mm-hmm. said. Um, <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow has been involved with all of them, playing Robert De Niro, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, um, first, I guess assistant, partner, assistant, love, yeah. who eventually takes over Stark Dark Enterprise, just, yeah, Pepper uh, Potts, yes. Classic uh, Marvel alliteration. Yeah, Stanley. There you go. Yeah, he Peter Parker. His, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, this is the third um, journey for Iron Man. This yep. time, it takes place post Avengers. Yep. This is the beginning of Phase Two. Yes, and this is sort of like he's dealing with the experience of New York, like you know, uh, almost dying, <laughs> going through the the was it the wormhole or whatever yeah. to the another Black dimension. Hole thingy. And uh, the devastation they caused yes. in New York, yeah. And he's presented with a new foe in the Mandarin. Yes, and he uses, uh, if I remember correctly, at least in this, is very big on using the media to. Yes, visit. he's a, he's very much a terrorist. Yes, he's very much sort of. I, I I can't speak to the comics Mandarin, but mm-hmm. he very much sort of exemplifies a sort of terrorist attitude where he sends videos. He has uh, bombings essentially uh-huh. around yeah. the world, stuff like that. He hits targets, <laughs> um, and you know it's it's very much about you know the fear that he's putting out there. He takes yes. over the airwaves so that like every station is tuned <laughs> into his broadcasts, and you know after some um, events. Tony Stark is brought into direct line with him yes. in pursuit of him. And it's sort of this interesting um, film, and I've seen it. Um, That's right. A Bastard. sort of paradox of both being the biggest film in terms of like huge CGI action sequences mm-hmm. and also the smallest film in that it's like partly like a thriller slash mystery where Tony Stark is alone on his own trying hmm. to figure out who the Mandarin is, awesome. what his plan is, and stuff like that. And it sort of cuts back and forth between the two. Uh, bet- of all the Iron Man movies, I thought it was probably the most consistent. Hmm. I would say it doesn't have the highest highs, but definitely doesn't have the lowest lows, which is fine. So maybe like one, three, two would be your order? Uh, no, I'd probably say three is the best. Okay. So because three, the, fir- one, the first half of one is fantastic, yeah. but the second half is very sort of blah. Um, but yeah, I'd say three, one, two for wow. sure. Nice. And you know, I like Shane Black a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, As do I. He does a lot. But again, you know, it suffers from having too many villains. It suffers from too much CGI. Like it becomes hmm. a little crazy heavy with the CGI <laughs> at times. And you know, I, I, I suspect it's you know the studio intervenes. It's basically the only other thing he's directed is kiss, or sorry, uh, yeah, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yeah, that's right. So like to go from he's that to some this, stuff, but I think yeah, I mean he wrote like Lethal Weapon yeah. stuff. So he's definitely he's definitely talented. But yeah, I mean it's it's a fun movie, but I'm. Not gonna say like I'm not more excited about Man of Steel or something like that <laughs> uh-huh. at this point, but it's 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 a solid one that's sure to make a ton of money. Coming out the first week of May, I mean that's like a classic superhero. Yeah, Thor came out the first week yeah. of May. Spider Man, Avengers. I mean it's just. It's... We'll say the biggest issue of the thing, uh, why they don't call in the Avengers in this movie. Mm. Don't really explain it. Like they just. Well, kind of is going underground. That's part of his. Well, role. I mean, like. After the Mandarin starts doing all this destruction, mm-hmm. it makes no logical sense that the Avengers won't eventually be like, maybe we should get involved with this. Like, it d- There's been a lot of just general discussion with Marvel about that and also with Dark World Thor 2 coming out, why Thor wouldn't do the same thing. And there's a lot of discussion about that. And the studio and Bill Feige, or Feige, how you pronounce yeah, his Feige. name, has said some statements that I, I kind of agree with, but... I won't necessarily well, pontificate I mean, on them now. There's like one throwaway line that's like, oh, this isn't a problem for the Avengers yet. And then it's just never mentioned because, again. Because, you know, the thing that pe- we f- people forget about is that, you know, the Avengers in the first movie barely were even able to work together as a team once. And so it's not like they're all people that just hang out and want to talk to each other. And they're kind of shoehorned together in the first place by Nick Fury. So sure. if Nick Fury doesn't okay. care, then okay. why with the rest of the Avengers? I- I'll grant you that. But it's essentially like, if... You know, America is threatened, 
You don't think the she that Shield's gonna try and step in at all? You don't think any of the other Avengers <laughs> might pop up and be like, you know what, I'm going to help out? Unfortunately, like, in the Marvel world, everybody has their own problems to deal with. So there's all there are villains specifically for let, Shield and specifically let me, for let all me the tell different you, people. Granted, with with the stuff that's going on, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But you know, it's still a fun film, and I still enjoyed it. So <laughs> uh, I definitely care to hear other people's opinions yes. after they see it. So. And it's a lot easier to say with Thor because he just goes to Asgard. It's kind of hard to follow someone to Asgard, but. <laughs> if well, Iron that, Man's well, still that, in well, Earth, sort of, it's a little sort of, harder. That's sort of the other <laughs> template that I used and sort of my um, thought of it was like, you know, they never really explained how Thor got back in the Avengers. It just mm. sort of happened. It just moved right along. Yeah. It's sort of the same sort of thing with the Avengers here. Is they're like, you're not just going to really get into it. You know, it is, is there a post-credits tease? No. Uh, there's, it's, there is a post-credits scene, but it's, it's not it's, a tease. No, okay. they've, they've, it's more of like Avengers than the okay. other ones, so okay. it's sort of something like that. Um Anyway, that brings us to the end. Join mm -hmm. us next time for our DVD rundown for May 7th. 7th. Yep. Yep, good call. And as always, we're at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. Uh, we're on iTunes, Blip.tv, Miro, Roku. Check in and get glue, get some badges, <laughs> stickers, things, give us some iTunes stars, and uh, thumbs on the YouTube. And comments, we love those. Mm -hmm. we'll shout bad at you. And, yeah, uh, we'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the side of Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.